Autolite and its 96,000 dealers present Suspense. Tonight, Autolite brings you Mr. Dennis O'Keefe in Very Much Like a Nightmare, a suspense play produced and edited by William Spear. Hello. Yeah? What spectacular event heralds the approach of summer? Why, getting an Autolite Stay Full battery, the battery that has three times as much liquid reserve above the plates as batteries without Stay Full features. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Come on now, Wilcox. I mean for fun, for pleasure, for excitement. Well, so do I, Hap. What could be more fun than driving a car that has an Autolite Stay Full battery to give you extra starting dependability? What can give you greater pleasure than the knowledge that your Autolite Stay Full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use? And what excitement when you find out that SAE Life Cycle Standard Tests show that Autolite Stay Full batteries give 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. The circus is what I had in mind, Harlow. You should have seen the menagerie. Every kind of animal. Camels? Naturally. Wouldn't be a circus without camels. Well, no camel can teetotal water like the Autolite Stay Full battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. Just remember, friends, you're always right with Autolite. And now with very much like a nightmare and the performance of Dennis O'Keefe, Autolite hopes once again to keep you in suspense. It started out like nothing more than a small, freakish accident. The kind of thing you could tell a little sheepishly as a joke on yourself. But by the time it was over, it was very much like a nightmare. A dream you wake up from, drenched in cold sweat, shaking all over with the clock pointing at 3 a.m. and the covers on the floor. It was only my second day back on the job after a short bout with the flu germ, and I'd been up practically all night working on a job my boss, old Hard Rock Gilman, had been kind enough to save, especially for me. As I walked into the lobby of the Nugent building, my biggest worry was simply whether the little pills my pharmacist mate Hermie had given me would keep me alive and jumping through a rather long day. Eddie, the hawk-faced kid who ran the elevator, was just about to take it up as I came in. Hold it, Eddie. Uh, oh, hiya, Mr. McClain. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Dupre. Didn't see you. Good morning. Oh, good morning, Mr. Dupre. How are you? Anybody for three? Don't think I've seen you around lately, Mr. McLean. No, I've been playing hooky. Lucky you. Bye, Eddie. Have I ever let you off any other place? <laughs> Mr. Prey, though not precisely my type, was one of the rare plus qualities to be discovered in the Nugent building. She was one of the few girls I've seen around office buildings who actually looked as though they belonged in somebody's penthouse apartment. She usually tagged along with Ferris, a cocky-looking character who also worked at Circassian Brothers Importers up on five. Five out. Watch your step. Thank you, Eddie. Uh, Miss Dupree. Yes? Um, uh, is, uh, everything all right? What? Oh, uh, yes, I think so, Eddie. But maybe you'd better check with Mr. Ferris. He may want to send out for a sandwich around 11. Okay. Seven, Mr. McLean. Watch your step. Thank you, Eddie. The morning went slowly, even with Hermes' pills to help. But at noon, I resumed a pleasant custom which had been temporarily interrupted by my illness. That of having lunch with Miss Catherine Warren, a delightful young lady on whose future I had very definite, if uh, not especially dark, design. Now for the gruesome lecture. What time did you go to bed last night, boss? Who, me? Last night? Well, All I... right, then. It was this morning. It was this morning, wasn't it? Mm, such a charming girl to be so snoopy. <laughs> Would you like to hear about a very interesting conversation I had going down on the bus this morning with a young man named Herman? Hermie? How a guy like that can run a prescription shop beats me. What would the doctors do if they knew he went around blabbing professional secrets? It's you, not Hermie, I'm concerned about. And I'd like to know what makes you think it's smart to start taking dope. Dope. Oh, that Hermie and his melodrama. All he gave me was something Something to... to keep you from getting the sleep you ought to be getting. At this rate, you'll be back in bed again before you know it. Ah, the 
Just little white pills. Perfectly harmless if you don't try to swallow the whole box. Why, Hermes says... Here, well, let's take a look for yourself. Uh, oh, that's it. Uh, it's the wrong box. What do you mean, wrong box? All right. So I'm a fugitive from a drug counter. These are the, uh, the other ones. The other ones? Well, the fact is, darling... At first, I was as leery about these stay-awake things as you are. I started worrying. Suppose the stuff was slow wearing off, or suppose I developed insomnia or something like that. Now, Hermes said he doubted that that would happen, but uh, just to make sure, he fixed me up with these uh, sleeping pills. More dope. Oh, look, honey. It's not Yeoman I'm doing this for. You know that. It's us. I wouldn't have tried to come to work. Uh, if... I know, I know, Bud. No. I'm sorry. Forget it. Shall I call you tonight before I tuck myself in? <laughs> If you don't, I'll come over and toss tear gas through your window. I made my way back toward the Nugent building, wedged very appropriately in a narrow dead-end street. About halfway down the block, I heard footsteps behind me, and then a voice, familiar enough. McLean! It was Ferris, Marie Dupree's boyfriend. Hi, McLean. Hadn't seen you around lately. Been out of town? No, just had to stay in for a few days. How's it with the Christian brothers? Never better. Never better. And with you? No complaints. Say, uh, say something was said in the elevator this morning. You know, Eddie, uh, about him picking up a sandwich for you around 11. I was wondering if that's just an arrangement with the people I'm here for. I don't get it, Mr. McLean. Eddie's never picked up any sandwiches for me. <laughs> Somebody's kidding. Oh, here we are. Going up. Oh, hi, Mr. Farris. Mr. McLean. All righty. Eddie, what's this about some sandwich service you've got? Been holding out on me? Uh, well, I, uh, uh... Well, Eddie, I, uh... I just thought I overheard you and Mr. Free say something about sending out for a sandwich, so I... Oh, no, no, that was, uh... No, you got us wrong. I, I never said I that. I told Mr. McLean, Eddie, that it was probably some kind of kidding you and Mr. Free were carrying on. That goes to show you should never kid on the job. Yes, sir. That's a good motto for Eddie, huh, Mr. McLean? Never kid on the job. The three of us stood silently in the rising elevator. It, uh, it seemed to me that Ferris had pushed the sandwich topic a little farther than necessary. Eddie was pretty upset. Well, why would he... Oh, well. Well, it wasn't any of my affair. I went back into my cubbyhole to wait till three o'clock, the hour for which Gilman had called a conference with Fisher of Barton and Fisher, well, okay. our big account. And it was in this conference that the, the sleep I hadn't got started creeping up on me. Out of a fleecy fog, I, I suddenly heard Gilman barking at me. McLean! Uh, yes, huh? Heaven's sake, what's the matter with you? You didn't get out of bed too soon, did you? Yes, sir. <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I'm all right, Mr. Gilman. Oh, oh, good. I'd appreciate your getting Mr. Fisher's brief finished up for me. I hate to ask you this, but I wonder if you'd mind getting it done before you go. Apology and stood up. My, my eyes burned and my neck muscles seemed to be dragging my head down as I went back to my office. It had been 10, maybe 12 hours since I had taken the last couple of stay awake pills. And if I could borrow enough energy for the next 45 minutes, I told myself I could clean up this last job and the whole blessed night would be mine for sleeping. This time I'd cut the dose in half, only take a single pill. So I shook one of the pills out of the little box and followed it with a glass of water. Then I sat down at my desk and unclipped the sheets that Gilman had given me. I don't know when it was that I, I noticed that the words had started running together. I, I looked at the papers and it was like peering through water. A bell was banging somewhere far off in the distance and I, I seemed to be lying across a bed. Slowly I forced over my eyes and blinked while reality swam into focus. For, for a moment I really didn't know where I was and it, it was just silence and the, the lost feeling of being in the wrong place. And suddenly I realized. The bed I had seemed to be lying across was my office desk. I, I couldn't quite get it clear. Well, what was I doing here? The outer office was nothing but darkness. Stiff and cramped, I stood up. I, I looked at my watch. 2.15. 2.15, but that, that's impossible. I, only a few minutes ago, I looked at my watch and it was... Oh, no. No, it couldn't have been a few minutes ago. Gilman was here then and Miss Tyler and the others. It, it can't be two in the morning. It, Oh, 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 bright boy, McLean. Hermes pills. 
For the second time, I'd made a stupid mistake about the pills. When I went into the washroom, I'd taken the wrong pills with me. The sleeping pills. The others were still in my top coat. I laughed again, but this time I I didn't like the sound so much. Somehow it seemed too hollow, and then suddenly, standing there in the middle of the floor, seven stories up in an empty office building, the darkness moved in on me, and I I got that funny feeling as as if the darkness wasn't all, as if I I had something worse to contend with, like, like in Blind Man's Buff when you're a kid and you shrink back and hold your breath while the hand fumbles past you in the darkness Weird as it seemed, all of, all of a sudden it was like being on the island again with the Japanese somewhere near you and not daring to light a match and holding your breath for the darkness so thick it choked you. Holding your breath because that overloud breath might be your last. Autolite is bringing you Dennis O'Keefe in Very Much Like a Nightmare. Tonight's production in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Carlo, one of the circus men told me that elephants drink ten gallons of water a day. Ten gallons a day? Wow. Mm -hmm. And an Autolite stay full battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. It's the super battery that has three times as much liquid reserve as batteries without stay full features. Yes, but the elephant is a mighty powerful critter, Wilcox. Well, I'll talk about power. Man, the Autolite stay full battery is amazing. You see, there's a fiberglass retaining mat at every positive plate to hold the power producing material in place. That gives you advantages like extra long life, extra starting dependability. You know, Wilcox, the elephant lives a phenomenally long life. Yes, but half think of the lifespan of the Autolite Stay Full Battery. Why, according to SAE Life Cycle Standard Tests, it gives 70% longer average life than batteries without Stay Full features. And the Autolite Stay Full Battery needs water only three times a year in normal car use. So, friends, see your friendly Autolite Battery dealer. And remember, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage our star, Dennis O'Keefe, in Very Much Like a Nightmare, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I felt my way out into the darkness beyond the door. The hall stretched out like a cave to the stairs and the faint red glow of the exit lights the angle of the stairs at the landing, there was a window, and I, I pressed my face against the cool of the glass. I had to wake up. And suddenly, a, a light fanned out over the loading platform down below. Somebody must have opened a door down there. I, I saw a truck and three or four men dwarfed by the distance, and the light from the door was gone, but I, I could still see the stabbing beams from a couple of flashlights. Who was working there at this hour? Why? And then I heard the whistling. Eddie. Eddie, the elevator boy. What are you doing here at this weird hour? Two o'clock in the morning in an empty building with no passengers? Lead-footed, I moved down one flight and waited there on the sixth floor, straining every cell to hear the whistling again, but I didn't. Instead, I I heard something from the fifth floor, and I I felt my way down toward it. Sure, I'm laughing, Joe, because I know Marie, and I know that when she talks like this, she's not meaning half what she's saying. And then we've been drinking, drinking. I haven't been drinking that much. We feed him everything he asks for. Line it up so that all he's got to do is walk in. And even before the stuff is out of the plate, he's ready to cheat us out of what he promised. Marie! So we get for letting ourselves get mixed up with us. Now, wait a minute. Shut no. up, <laughs> Now, I tell you something, Miss Dupree. You don't know who you're fooling with. You start calling names, and you're going to get hurt worse. Lots worse. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hit you, and that ain't all. You figure you don't get enough for what you do. You figure you're being cheated out of your cock. But I tell you something now. You open your mouth the wrong way, I handle you myself. No way, Joe. You think we're so scared of you? We'll stand for anything, don't you? Well, if I get nothing, you get nothing, too. Open my mouth. I'll open my mouth over. We never should... Where you Marie. think you've gone from? Marie! Back to Let you. Me go. Let me go. I told you. No. I told you to keep your mouth shut. What was this nightmare I'd stumbled into? If I hadn't been groggy and I looked down on the platform from seven, it would have been tipped off by the flashlights. 
Circassian would never have had his workmen stumbling around in that sketchy light with stuff costing a small fortune. The elevator. Eddie was in on it, too, handling something a little hotter now than sandwiches. But after the doors opened, I, I noticed that the whistling stopped like being cut in two by a knife. The longer I stood there, the more unhealthy my position became. And then I wondered about Albert, the night watchman. Where was he? He had a gun, but suddenly I I wanted to get out of there more than anything in the world. Just get out. My dash for the stairs to the fourth floor was like a slow-motion dream. Hermie and his sleeping pills plumped to the floor just out of range of the nearing light as the elevator dropped toward me. And suddenly there it was, a nakedly lighted little room suspended in space. I was staring through its fourth wall at Eddie. His face looked sick and green as he hugged the corner there at the controls as if nothing could make him look behind to the rear of the car where a big man I hadn't seen before held something in his arms. Something like an oversized doll whose legs dangled limply. My panic was fighting my fogginess. I stood there trying to think. Then I remembered the telephone. There was a perfectly good phone in my office. But that was five flights up, five long flights. Hadn't there been a phone on one of the other floors, a pay station fought my way upward again and found it. I found it on the third. I remembered not to close the door of the booth completely because if I did that, the little light would flash on and light was the last thing I wanted. I, I broke the phone off the hook, took a deep breath, and... A coin sounded louder than a fire bell in the dead of night. Clumsily, I, I dialed the operator. Number, please. Number, please. The dope... The words wouldn't come out. Number, please. Police. I want the police. My palms were sweaty. I I was listening with half an ear down the hall. I thought I heard a slight scuffling sound, but I couldn't be sure. Why was it taking so long? Police department. Hello. I'm calling from the Nugent building on 3rd Street North. There's there's a robbery going on here. A robbery. A a girl's been killed. What's that address? Who's calling? My name's McLean, Bartley McLean. I, I work in this building. The, the address is... All right, mister. Hang up that phone. A sudden glare of the flashlight struck across my face like a fist. I shriveled and nothing inside. And, and I saw the man behind the gun. It wasn't Joe. It wasn't any of the men I'd expected. It was the guy I'd almost written off as gagged and tied or dead. Albert. Albert, the night watchman. Hang it up. Albert. I was looking Hello. for you a while ago. Hello, police it's all right. I, I'm McLean. Bart McLean, remember? Gilman and company up on the seventh floor. Hang you... up that phone, Mr. McLean. Hello, would you repeat? Oh, look, you don't understand. You don't know what's going on. I know what's going on, all right. Oh, will you take that gun out of my face? I, I tell you, there's a gang of crooks in this building. Albert. You uh, never should have been here tonight, Mr. McLean. What? Come on. We're going to see him. Him? Joe. Come on. Walk. It was a trick we practiced a hundred times for combat use, but I never tried it before when it really counted. So it came to the head of the stairs, I whirled and chopped down hard with my right hand. I heard the gun go clattering, but my timing was way off. My lever and left never got into the play. Albert had me by the throat and two of his pitched down the steps toward the landing. Locked together like a couple of wrestlers, but it was Albert who took the brunt of the fall. His heart was still beating. He he was just knocked out before... For how long? Suppose when someone had heard us. They they must have heard us in the gun fall, too. The the gun. Up at the top of the stairs. I I had to get it. I I had to get that gun. I had the gun in my hand. I I didn't feel so naked now. I headed upstairs for Gilman and Company's quarters fast door was still ajar the way I'd left it. I slipped in and closed it behind me. I knew that maybe I had only a matter of a few minutes to get out of final SOS. Albert would come to and start talking. I stumbled over to my desk and put the gun down and started to reach for the phone. Like, right, fella, just stay where you are. What did I tell you, Ferris? I knew our boy would be coming back to see us. Let's go in and visit Petey. Okay, guy. Move out where we can see you. Petey, Ferris, at least three of them, and everything was in their favor. My hands moved even before I thought the desk drawer was open. I slid the gun into it, then moved in front of the door. Okay, Mac. 
or whatever your name is. Petey. Yeah. Look him over. Yeah, sure, Joe. Ain't you hanging around here a little late, Mac? Why, I... I went down the hall for a minute. I had some work to do. I guess I fell asleep. When I woke up, I just wanted to find out what time it was. Hey, mister, I think you pick a bad night to work late. Petey, you wait in the hall and keep your eyes open. In five minutes, we'll be out of this dump. You stay here with this guy, Fred. You're no good to us downstairs, and I'm tired of looking at you. Petey, yeah. I'll tell you what. I think maybe we better make it easy for Fred. Oh, no, look, Joe, I mean, uh, no more What are you talking now. about? What are you Please. talking about? I mean, suppose we take this guy's tie, make a nice handcuff for him. Then these two businessmen can sit down and talk business until we're ready to go. In a few seconds, not only were my wrists locked together, but I was sitting in the chair facing the door while Farrah slumped in the seat I wanted to have. A chair at the desk, inches away from the gun in the drawer. Farris didn't look at me at all. Silence ticked by in ages. I, I shifted a little in my seat, testing Farris, seeing if he'd notice, but I, I got no reaction. Just that queer look on his face. The elevator would be bringing bad news in a matter of heartbeats. I had... Hey. Hey, who was that? Uh-huh. What? On the phone, the telephone. Oh, the phone? Why, it's, it's my wife, I guess. You, yeah, you see, I, I told her I'd be working late. She's probably calling to say that she's on her way down to pick me up. Why, is she coming down here? Look, Joe don't want nobody else butting in down here. Well, I don't want her down here any more than you do, but... The phone ringing and ringing like that, you should just figure I've dozed off and come on down. Yeah, but Joe might... Hey, Farris, don't you think this guy had better answer? Come over here, mister. Talk to her. Tell her, uh... Hello? Tell her she, she don't have to Hello? pick you up. Hello, Bud? Hello, darling. I figured it was time you were calling. Oh, it is you, Bud, darling. I've been worried out of my mind. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. Hermie and I have tried to... Oh, yes, dear, yes. Uh, I've just about wound up the work for the uh, Warren people. I, I figured you were just having a little trouble putting Junior to bed. Listen, tell her but... not to come down. What is it? What are you talking about? Who is Junior and the Warren people? Yes, darling. Uh, put the car back in the garage. Uh, Hermie, uh, Hermie is here. He, he's going to drive me home. Hermie? But Hermie's here with me. Don't you... Bart, is something wrong? You're absolutely right, dear. Absolutely. Oh, Bud, darling. All right, don't talk all night. <laughs> Goodbye, darling. Bud! Who is this, Jaime? Why, oh, he's, uh, he's a friend of mine. Sometimes we both work late and he drives me home. I, well, I had to tell her something she'd believe. I, I didn't want to call him back. Yeah, well, we'll fix that. So he pointed me back to my chair and took the receiver off the hook. And all the time, we might have been pictures on the wall for all the interest that Ferris took in us. Petey went back out in the hall, and when Ferris did speak, it was all I could do to keep from jumping out of my skin and his face. I suddenly remembered when and where I'd seen a look like the one on Ferris's face. Funny thing. All this time, I never knew you were married. Oh, yes, yes. I married three years now. Marie and me, we... That's what we had in mind all the time. We figured we could make it work. We were going to get married. But you know how it is sometimes. You burn up all you make on clothes and car fare. Phil said no rough stuff. Marie just got excited. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. He didn't have to. All right, Farris. Here they come. Let's roll. Farris. Huh? Farris, listen to me. The desk drawer in front of you. There's a gun in there. A gun. A gun. Joe. Joe's coming back. There's not much time, Ferris. Right in front of you. In a desk drawer. Open it. Get the gun. So, here's the boy who went out to find what time it was. Smart boy. Can't keep his nose out of people's business. Well, we're going to fix all that up. Oh, look, Joe. Shut here. up. We found the watchman wife guy. But one little thing we didn't find. We don't find the gun you took off of him. Now, you're going to tell me where that gun is. I got something figured out for that little gun. Okay, where is it? Come on. Ask me, why don't you, Joe? Is this what you're looking for? Oh! Oh, wait a minute! With a 
first shot Ferris buckled, sweeping the lamp off the desk. In the darkness, I groped for the outer office. Petey was in my path, but he was through stopping anybody. When I got to the window, there's the first landing. I didn't waste motion this time in the lock, especially with my hands done up the way they were. I kicked twice, and the pain was out of the window, and then I was out. And my escape was rickety, but it had a railing, and the cold, wonderful night air was smacking me in the face. Then, just as I realized that the throbbing in my left arm meant that not all the stray let it miss me, I, I heard the music that I had been waiting for. Bless her. Bless my Catherine. Well, I'm I'm not in the Nugent building anymore, and here at Pratis and Miles, I manage to exercise such talents and training as I have without putting too great a strain on my blood pressure. A situation which not only pleases Mrs. McLean, a girl named Catherine, but also meets with the unreserved approval of her husband. Aside from an aversion to little white pills and a tendency to sneak frequent looks at his watch long about closing time each day, that husband is reputed to have only the normal number of faults. His greatest strong point remains his memory, which is uh, convenient equipment for anniversaries. It will also ever be cherished for reminding him that the look on the face of a fellow named Ferris was a carbon copy of the expression he had last seen the day one of the men in his outfit disobeyed orders and wiped out half a dozen belligerent nipponies. Ferris got only two, while a man who was protesting what had happened to his brother got twice that many. But it is possible that he died just as happy. Personally, I... Oh, good Lord. Look what time it is. Where's my briefcase? Go on down. Hold it, Johnny. Make room for one more. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Dennis O'Keefe. Harlow, you just can't beat the circus for real thrills. The suspense is terrific when the barker sings out, Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please. Autolite makes more than 400 products for cars, trucks, planes, and boats in 28 plants coast to coast. These include complete or perfectly, work together perfectly, because they're a perfect team. So, friends, don't accept electrical parts supposed to be as good. Ask for and insist on Autolite, original factory parts. At your neighborhood service station, car dealer, garage, or repair shop. Remember, you're always right with Autolite. Next Thursday for Suspense, our star will be Mr. Edward G. Robinson. The play is called A Case of Nerves, and it is, as we say, a tale well calculated to keep you in Suspense. Tonight's Suspense play was produced and edited by William Spear and directed by Norman MacDonald. Music for Suspense is composed by Lucian Morawieck and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Very Much Like a Nightmare is an original play written for radio by M. Carl Holman and John Michael Hayes. Dennis O'Keefe may soon be seen co-starred with Anne Sheridan in the Howard Welch production, Woman on the Run. In the coming weeks, you will hear such stars as Charles Boyer, Broderick Crawford, and Jack Carson. Don't forget, next Thursday, same time, Autolite will present Suspense, starring Edward G. Robinson. You can buy Autolite faithful batteries, Autolite resistor or regular spark plugs, Autolite electrical parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This week marks the 16th annual observance of World Trade Week. Every one of us has a stake in the commerce our country carries on with the rest of the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. You've been listening to the OTR Gold Network. Find more classic radio at otrgold.com.